Hello, this is Mr. Inadequate. I am playing a new game, Suzerain. I have never played this. I have seen it on YouTube, but I, it's a different kind of game for me. I believe it's all text-based, and you have to make a lot of decisions as the ruler of a country. Let's get into it. Hopefully it won't take long to load, being a text-based game. You are my enslavement, my freedom. You are my flesh, burning like a raw summer night. You are my country. Azim Hikmed Ran. I believe we have some decisions to make here. 1908, Kingdom of Swordland. You opened your eyes to this world. You came from... I'm going to be a middle-income family in the city of Holsort. Your parents named you Anton. As the only child of a diligent civil servant, you lived quite an ordinary childhood. Life was not bad. You were lucky enough to attend a well-known public school. But frequent fights broke out at the Rain family home. These made you feel uneasy. The years passed. Okay, September 9th, 1923, during a history class at school. Hold on half a second while I write something down. The bell started to ring unexpectedly. You heard a loud commotion outside. As everyone tried to figure out what was going on, the principal announced the historic revolution. The kingdom was no more. The Republic of Swordland was born. You did not fully understand. I have no idea what these decisions are going to lead to. 1926. After graduating, you passed the university exam with high marks. You had the opportunity to choose between several studies. You chose law at the Holstert State University, economics at the Lechavin Business School, history at the Dyer, Un Dare? Dyer University of Culture. History is what I chose. During the first year, you attended a lecture with David Whiskey. I apologize for not mispronouncing names. He was a well-known diplomat from the foreign ministry and the son of the president. After observing the, the hall in silence, he explained why real politic is important for successful foreign policy. He argued that a strategy based on practical and material factors would be much more successful in reaching Swordland's ambitions. You agreed in principle. You questioned what you were being taught. Your only concern was passing the exams. We're going to question everything. May 22, 1927. Soldiers entered the campus in the evening ahead of the first election. Many were in shock as the uniformed men created a security cordon and started arresting the teachers. A group of students started gathering in protest. Along with your best friend, Peter Vectern, you decided to protest. One of the officers made a loud announcement that echoed through the campus. General Luderman declared martial law in order to restore the administration. Please stand back and disperse to your rooms. You joined the students that slowly marched towards the large group of soldiers. Suddenly, the soldiers charged. A student fell and was trampled as everyone started running away. I'm going to hold my ground. The, so the soldiers beat you relentlessly. It was a gloomy year. October 10th, 1927. The coup split the students into two groups and caused frequent fights. Excuse me. Torture and imprisonment of any opposing voice became a daily routine in Dare. You didn't want to stand idle and decided to join Hmm, a human rights group, a student council, 
a political debate group. Well, I'm a history ma major. I basically stand my ground and question everything. I'm going to do a pol political debate group. The dozens of debates helped you hone your oratory skills while also helping you grow your network. Even though the debates were pretty heated between different groups, you all grew from sharing ideas. In one of the meetings, Peter introduced you to one of his friends, Monica, who was a volunteer for the Sordish League of Women. You were immediately attracted to her... Hmm. Diligence or intelligence? Intelligence. <coughs> I'm just trying to role play this as the person that I'm trying to be. The politically charged environment led you to join the Red Youth, the Socialists, join the Young Swords, the Nationalists, stay away from any political organization. Hmm. Stand my ground. History. I think we're going to go with the Young Swords and Nationalists. June 2nd, 1928, the radio relayed that the Communist General Ricard surrounded Luteran and his troops, demanding their surrender. They refused, and heavy fighting broke out across the country. You just couldn't believe it. The army was fighting among themselves. Swordland plunged into chaos. Ricard's sudden attack caused even more bloodshed in the country. He seemed different compared to fascist Lutheran. In your opinion, however, he was more of the same. So you par participated in a protest march. You were chanting, one nation, one system, one people. End the chaos, we want stability. United we stand, divided we fall. Hmm. I'm a nationalist. You were marching against Ricard. The students and soldiers supporting the coup gathered a few hundred meters away. Many socialists were among them, and you knew something was going to happen. You stayed, because we stand our ground. There was a massive clash between the two sides. Soldiers began to beat the students. Tanks started rolling forward. In this chaotic moment, you saw a young girl about to get run over by a tank. You ran to save her. But you couldn't reach her in time. You never forgot her face. The clash has escalated into a full-blown civil war. The horrors made you isolate yourself for a while. Monica helped you cope and love grew between the two of you. However, it was a difficult time for love. The chaos must end. 1929, Republic of Swordland. The charismatic Colonel Tarquin Soul organized a sudden coup and brought an end to the chaos. He wrote a new constitution and restored stability. The people saw him as a savior. He formed the United Swordland Party and ran as a presidential candidate in the first ever elections. You voted for the United Swordland Party because we are a socialist are not a socialist, a nationalist. And he is at least trying to uh, unite the country. June 1929. USP won the election by a large majority. After graduation, you kept seeing Monica and noticed her interest to marry. However, a letter arrived from the military calling for you to fulfill your compulsory service. It was time to serve your national duty. February 1930, Bergia region. A devastating civil war broke out in the neighboring country, Weyden. The distinguished major, Josef Lencia, ordered you to lead your squad on a border patrol mission. It was a very cold winter night when you began, began marching out of Gummerin outpost. You could see your breath.
Hmm. After several hours of marching through the snowy hills, distant noises were heard. Visibility was too low to confirm the source. The squad crawled forward in formation and found a spot to observe. A group of refugees had made it beyond the border fence. Ah. You let them slip through. You're going to be in trouble, I know it. After the patrol, Major Lancia arrived with anger and immediately relieved you of your command, calling you a disappointment. One of your squad members had reported your actions. After several months of scrubbing the floors as a punishment, your duties ended and you went back to civilian life. <laughs> this is very interesting. 1931. You and Monica decided to share your lives together. After receiving the blessing of her parents, a ceremony was held in Hulsa. During the same year, you worked hard to secure a high-paying job at the governing United Swordland Party. It was much more difficult to start your career on a good fo foot because of the refugee incident, but still you managed. Working for the ruling party was the easiest path, path to power. The financial compensation was too great to pass up. It was the best opportunity to change the country for the better. You became the foreign policy assistant to one of the more experienced members of assembly. You worked long and hard, staying late at work, reviewing dozens of foreign policy plans. You were climbing the ladder. September 1933. Saul strengthened the Republic by removing the institutions and symbols of the former kingdom from society. Things were also looking up for the country as the massive economic boom continued and people were the happiest they'd been in a decade. Election time came and it was decided. President Tarkin Sol was elected once more. April 2, 1934. The preparation of the most comprehensive trade agreement with Agnolia was occupying most of your personal time. <coughs> Sorry. But your significant contribution to the trade talks triggered an invitation to meet President Tarkin Sol himself, who offered you a key position. You were to become the youngest member of assembly. I'm a nationalist. I'm for strengthening the country. I accept it right away. June 1938. As the youngest MP, it was difficult to connect with the influential inner circle. You needed allies, so you brought Peter as your right-hand man. The birth of your son, Frank, provided a Brief moment of joy and relief. You, huh? I'm gonna regret this. Sacrifice family to improve your position in the party. Cat in the cradle. October 1941. Along with Peter, you have done great things to cement your position in the party. Meanwhile, at home. Monica and Frank felt your absence. At the same time, President Saul increased his authority over the years. His growing ego started to cause strife within the party. The cracks began to show. October 1945, President Saul barely secured a majority in the election against the opposition leader. Over the past year, people were growing discontent with corruption and the worsening quality of life. Meanwhile, calls for a United Swordland Party Congress became louder as the leadership struggle started to brew. You joined the internal opposition. July 1946. You gave your support to Ewald Alfonso, a reformist and talented business magnet who was the main contender for party leadership. Meanwhile, in a desperate effort to secure votes before the Congress, President Saul was meeting party members one by one. But he didn't approach you. The party Congress was nothing short of impressive. The banners of United Sortland were de decorating every possible spot. 
Thousands of influential political figures, lobbyists, and benefactors gathered for this turning point. The voting for the party leadership began. While I'm considering my vote, I'm going to drink a lot of reading in this, which I should have guessed at. You voted for Ewald Alfonso. September 1st, 1946, the efforts bore fruit as the contentious leadership vote was won by Ewald Alfonso. During the Congress, Sol announced his retirement from politics. He knew the structure he had established was to stay. The country had become increasingly authoritarian. You were troubled by the departure of Saul. October 15, 1946. A month later, your daughter was born. Monica named her Deanna. She motivated you during a tumultuous period in the party. The general elections were approaching. The United Swordland Party was under the new leadership of Ewald Alfonso. You joined the party effort and campaigned for him. 1949. During the general elections, the main opposition leader was embroiled in a sex scandal with his secretary, diminishing their chances. <coughs> the extensive privatization program proposed by Ewald Alfonso secured an election victory for the United Sorland Party. Over the next years, did your best, you did your best in order to make Sorland a better place tried all that was necessary to climb up the ladder, dedicate yourself to the party and its successes. Did your best. The 1951. The presidency of Ewald Alfonso saw many bold reforms, but was followed by a serious economic recession. The other parties announced their bids for the 1953 election, but the unfair system hampered all opposition efforts to win. You Thought your party could not survive another crisis. We're worried about the economic recession. Worried that you're okay. I'm not worried about that. We were worried about the economic recession. Together with Peter, your presence in the USP grew and you became the face of a new wing in the party. You effectively took over the leadership as President Alfonso lost control of the country. Moment to make a move had come. You blamed Alfonso for the crisis on television, bribed and extorted Alfonso's inner circle, advised Alfonso to step down quietly, behind the scenes. January 1953, he didn't take your advice seriously and started to reshovel his cabinet, but most of his inner circle abandoned him. Your diplomatic attitude made the party vote you in as the leader. Following this, you announced that you would be running for president in the general election with Peter as your running mate. It was your turn. October 1953. After visiting every city and town during the campaign, you made a speech on state television. You promised to, I'm a nationalist, remember? Preserve national values. Great nation of Swordland, due to the incompetent leadership, enemies both internal and external are influencing our glorious nation. Today, more than ever, we need to unite under one flag and protect our values. Gracie Swordland, the broadcast ended. November 5th, 1953. On election day, millions went out to cast their votes. It was time to face the truth. Chapter 1, President Rain. Okay, let's see.
We'll do this. Thin glasses. We'll go with the office. So that's my character. Yes. Okay, election promises. As Anton Rain, you have made many promises to the people of Sorbonne in order to gain their voices. They must be considered very carefully. Economy. Sorland's economy has been based on a plan doctrine since its formation under the former president, Ewald Alfonso, enacted free market reforms. Now the country finds itself in between two different economic systems. We're going to promote a planned economy. Diplomacy, the intensifying global rivalry between capitalist Sarkasia in the West and Communist United Cantana in the East is opening do, new diplomatic possibilities. Sorland could take steps to align itself closer to one. Hmm. Let's try the East. In recent years, Bludish, Wizik, and Agnolian Immigrants flocked to Sorbonne due to relaxed immigration laws enacted by Ewald Alfonso. As a result, tensions in between swords and immigrants have been increasing. Tighten immigration. Next. I would like to point out these are not necessarily things I, Mr. Inadequate, would do, but I'm trying to role play uh, this guy here. Anton Rain. We have term focus. We have also promised to focus on certain extensive subject within our first term. The people expect us to solve the negative situations within this topic while providing an overall improvement to the related policies. Now I get to choose one, I guess. Health. Since the 1940s, the difference of service quality between urban and rural hospitals has been getting increasingly worse and the average life expectancy has dropped significantly. Education, the lack of schools, teachers, and even classroom equipment in certain areas causes massive gaps in the previously robust education system. Law enforcement, increased crime is pushing law enforcement to their limits while judges at courts deal with a huge and expanding backlog of legal cases. <coughs> military, the military protects the country from hostile threats and while some see it as a massive financial burden, others argue it as a critical deterrence. I'm going to be a law and order guy. Yes. Two weeks have passed since we won the election. And I was about to be sworn as the fourth president of Sorbonne. Thousands were watching the inauguration ceremony and cheering my name, Anton Rain. The die was cast. And there my story began. In the distance, the Maroon Palace stood on top of the famous Hill of Pride. I had no way of knowing what future awaited me there. I looked at my family. My son and daughter, Frank and Deanna, were next to Monica, my wife. Her eyes were glimmering with pride. Then I tor turned towards the key people who made it all possible. Of course, each individual was promised an important position in my cabinet. As my thoughts slowly faded away, the reality of the situation dawned on me. Orso Hawker, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, was waiting for me. Orso Hawker, the time for the oath has come. I am ready. 
Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will respectively execute the office of the President of Sorbonne. And to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. And to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. The people and the Constitution of the Republic of Sorbonne. Orso Hawker, you may now deliver your inauguration speech, Mr. President. It is an honor, sir. Brothers and sisters are my fellow swords. My fellow swords. The crowd looked very eager to listen to me. The idea of unity. For many generations, this country and its long history have kept us tied to an idea, the idea of unity, and our people's right for a free and prosperous life. If we stand together, we prevail. In the past, there have been times of survival, times of conflict and economic hardship too. But whenever we stood together, we prevailed. Okay. The future awaits us. It's time to turn our faces to the east. <laughs> the future awaits us. It's time to turn our faces to the east. Our capacity as a nation has never been greater. Hundreds of thousands cheered. They were shouting my name in unison. I felt the responsibility, the power and the burden all at the same time. Raised fist. I raised my fist in the air, which triggered a huge applause. I took a long look at the people. I took a long look of, at the people of Sorland to burn this moment into my memory. One of the presidential guards came by to notify that it was time to leave. I made my way to the leading car in the motorcade. The presidential state car was a jet black cadilla with forms of Sorland above the front headlights. Next to it was a man holding the door. Serge Walkner. Hello, Mr. President. Still under the effect of the speech I made, hearing my new title made me smile. If you allow me to introduce myself, I am Serge, your new driver. Nice to meet you, sir. It is an honor. He respectfully bowed his head before opening the car door and gesturing inside. I entered the car. We will be heading towards the palace. The motorcade began to move. On the way, Serge proceeded to explain his duties as a driver. As minutes passed by, I found myself lost in thoughts again, barely paying attention to what he was saying. He suddenly made a gesture towards the now closer palace. Isn't it a beauty? The maroon palace. He was right. Sunlight glinted off the palace's many maroon-colored domes. It was so bright that I had to look away. Every time I look at it, I am reminded of my duty to this nation. Okay, I can choose four, one of four options. It is in good hands now. Kind of arrogant. Two, so do I, Serge. It is the beating heart of the nation, after all. Kind of nationalist. Three, we all owe a great debt to the men who led the country from here. I don't think so. Four, it's just the building, Serge. I'm going to do two. So do I, Serge. It is the beating heart of the nation, after all. As minutes pass by, I... Okay, where am I? Forgot it was continuing. Okay, well said, Mr. President. The car drove past the majestic gates, continued uphill to the entrance, and stopped in front of the doors. Serge got out of the car and opened the door for me. Have a great day, Mr. President. Ah, uh, Morgna Westcor. He referred to the famous Swordish phrase from the times of revolution. Ah, uh, Morgna Westcor, Victor and Sista, which meant 
Morning will come. Victory is close. Victor and Sista. Victory is close. I made my way upstairs through the extravagant quarters of the palace. Marble and engraved wooden finishes decorated the interior. My footsteps echoed in the massive halls. The guards bowed their heads in respect as I opened the massive doors to my new office. And, let's see. Read the report from Holsart. Logistical issues. The mayor of Holsart reports that the rising population and fast urban expansion has resulted in high levels of congestion in the city traffic. Logistic report underlines increased traffic and slow transportation routes as the big, biggest problems of the capital. The mayor also reported that the absence of a well-designed, large, land-based logistics center where all transporters come together is one of the greatest problems for domestic transporters because Hulsard is a big metropolis. Transporters are scattered all over Hulsard, having established such centers in 10 different districts. Okay. General report from Okay, General Staff gathers. The General Staff convened right after the election to congratulate our victory. All the branches of the Sortis Armed Forces were represented in the meeting that took place at Camp Strong Arm with massive security measures. The Chief of the Armed Forces, Walking Kruger, made a public press statement highlighting the increasing chances of military confrontation in eastern Merkoba and requested support to strengthen the military. Okay. And I think what I'm going to do is end this. This is Mr. Inadequate. I have been playing Suzerain, and this has been episode one. I hope you all enjoyed it.